it's time, but uh, <laughs> even one of my co chairs is missing. I, I just see. You can sit wherever you want. <laughs> right. But we only have 60 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, d I also did see him uh, five minutes ago. <laughs> ah. <laughs> he cannot say goodbye. <laughs> Well, one is remote over there, but I'm uh, surprised that uh, Donald E is not here. <laughs> Put it in this room. Ah, it's Lou. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Yes, um, since we're already uh, three minutes over the hour, I'd like to start and I hope that uh, Donald Eastlake, my uh, newly appointed uh, extra co-chair will uh, show up any minute now. Um, this is Mane. If you haven't done so already, please sign in to the meeting so that we can keep track of uh, the tremendous amount of uh, people that uh, are attending this uh, session. You should be familiar with the note bell, um, which points to uh, a number of other documents. And um, I ask a special uh, attention to the uh, code of conduct. Um, we hope to uh, exchange views in a polite manner uh, and keep things uh, reasonable. <laughs> if you ever have the feeling that you are uh, the victim of harassment, please contact uh, the Ombuds team um, and they will know uh, what to do. Um, we're not supposed to say a shares, this does not happen in this working group. I have not seen it happen for a long time. I have seen it happen in the past and it was ugly. Um, but chairs cannot know everything. So again, if there is something that you feel is not right, go to the Ombuds team and hopefully we will be made aware of it in, in some way without uh, necessarily uh, revealing your identity. Meeting tips, 
well, hopefully you know how to uh, work with Meet Echo or Meet Echo Lite. Resources for the whole of this uh, IETF in San Francisco. Resources for this session in particular. Um, easily accessible through a single link and then you find all the other uh, URLs that, that take you to uh, the agenda slides, uh, etc. The agenda for this meeting, introduction is what I'm doing now. Um, we really would have to like to have uh, note takers. Don is taking notes, but uh, he could help, could use some help uh, from uh, other attendants in the room or remote. Um, if uh, anyone wants to bash the agenda after the chairs have uh, bashed it again uh, fairly recently, today, um, please say so. Um, if not, then we go to workgroup status. Monet is about to recharter. Um, Babel is about to be closed down. They have one document that uh, that is progressing, and uh, if that has made its way through uh, IESG review. Uh, that group will be closed, but this does not mean the end of Babel. Babel will be merged with Monet. Then we will have uh, some Babel items on the new Monet charter. Uh, last year, when we had a combined uh, role Monet Babel meeting, uh, Dave Tate uh, uh, suggested that we should call the group Mabel. We're not going to do that, uh, as far as I know. We keep the mobile ad hoc networking name. Um, and we have to see uh, what will be on the new charter. But uh, as a sort of a byproduct of this foreseen merge of the two groups, uh, Donald Eastlake has been uh, appointed as an additional chair to, um, to the Monet working group. So we now have three chairs. But uh, if he does not show up in two minutes, then he will be fired again. <laughs> so uh, on the agenda for today is our two presentations. And those two presentations uh, are about work items that we may take on after uh, the rechartering. Uh, and we decided to uh, rearrange the uh, agenda in such a way that we would first have those two presentations and then um, we will uh, use the, re the remainder of, uh, of the time of this session to have uh, a discussion, uh, hopefully, uh, on uh, other items or those two items and other items that uh, could find a place on the new charter. Um, a quick document status. Um, there are four drafts all to do with credit-based flow control. They have been on, um, on the working group. Uh, <coughs> in the working group for far too long. Um, Lou has gotten uh, pretty frustrated about that and I can imagine why. Um, they were expired. They were expired. Somebody has his audio on. Um, but uh, Lou was uh, kind enough to revive them just before the uh, uh, cutoff for, uh, for this meeting. Uh, I vow to really make some progress on these things. I'm, I've appointed myself shepherd of, uh, of these documents. I have almost finished um, 
my shepherd writer for the first one. It was the very first time I ever did that. Um, it's a long questionnaire with lots of questions. I think I've covered most of it. Uh, there is a, a sneak preview uh, if you want to see what I've been doing. The URL is, uh, is given there. Um, the first three of those drafts were under uh, TSV Art, uh, Area Review Team uh, Review. The, the main sticking point was the fact that we have had three documents. Uh, uh, the reviewer, David Black, has never seen uh, that fourth one. I don't. <laughs> Just in time. Um, so we have to add uh, that fourth document, and then it will be much clearer to the reviewer why uh, we have four documents. Um, we have uh, talked to this over this uh, at various uh, previous uh, Monet meetings and on the mailing list, and we decided to stick with. Um, the structure that we have with the four documents and um, the TSV art reviewer has asked that we put a, a rationale for this in the shepherd write-up, which is what I tried to do. So I'm not sure whether I should be using the microphone or not because we're a nice little small team here and probably you can hear me fine, but yeah. Just, just one point of clarification on those four drafts. I'm assuming those have already gone through working group last call? Yes. Okay, all right, yes. I just wanted to confirm that. So, so we're at the last stages of those documents that the working group's done what they need to do and so forth. So those are gonna be coming to me pretty soon by the sounds of things. They have uh, languished in the working group uh, last call uh, for a very long time because nobody was commenting. But okay. uh, finally, uh, we decided that uh, they were uh, they were uh, ready. Ready. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I did review them myself. Yeah. Um, next step after that will be uh, the routing directorate uh, review. Um, that's been suggested to do this in parallel, but uh, I really wanted a stable source, uh, so I want to. I want to have these. Uh, comments from uh, TSV Art Review uh, are cleared. And I have some other comments myself, which I will send to the mailing list. Lou? I did try to enter the queue, this is Lou Berger, uh, but it, it, for those who can't see, it says server unreachable. So, uh, sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, I, I would like to request that you do the uh, routing directorate review. Um, these things have been stable literally for years. The changes are tiny and not technically significant. Uh, there's no reason to have a, a longer holdup, unless, of course, the AD says he'll take the review on after it's submitted uh, for publication, because it's, there's no reason to hold things up longer and adding more serial steps. So if you could just push, it's a, it's a single button push to request the review on each of the documents. If you could push four times, really appreciate it. Thank you. That's right. Yes, but uh, having spent some time with the documents uh, over the last few days, th there are a few niche that I want to clear with, uh, with Lou, and then I'll do it. Um, Lou Berger again. I think these past working group last call, two, three, you know, pre-pandemic years ago, um, it's time. And, you know, yeah. if, they're, if they're niche there, that's what the uh, editor takes care of. You know, let, let, let's move these things forward. Sure. Or, or if, you know what? If you want to kill him, fine. I don't kill, want to kill him. Uh, kill him. And, I don't want you know, to kill frankly, him. Frankly, then I'm done with the working group. Uh, and if I sound a little annoyed, how many years? 
Yeah, I know. Moving on, we had some uh, individual drafts to do with uh, uh, Phi uh, physical layer uh, related uh, DLIP extensions. They had also expired. They are now revived. I had the chance to talk to the author uh, face to face uh, six or seven weeks ago. He convinced me uh, of the use of these things in case that you have very low uh, capacity links and uh, radios or modems don't have uh, much room to uh, ex exchange all sorts of information between themselves, which then can be used to put in, uh, into DLAB. Um, and then you can always lose the, use these uh, local parameters to uh, have a better than nothing uh, information about uh, about the links. Uh, one of those has already been through a working group adoption call, but there were some comments, but no uh, clear statements in favor or against adoption. So uh, I uh, agreed with at least uh, Don Fedek to put these three through a working group uh, adoption call again, uh, directly after this meeting. Um, and I, as a working group participant, are, am, am strongly in favor of uh, adopting uh, these. And then we have uh, one new individual draft, and I would like to invite uh, David uh, to uh... Amy went to uh, advance. Yeah, okay. So um, my name is David Ru uh, from Huawei Technologies. Um, I'm going to present a new draft, um, the stoop called a kind of a generic uh, topology update um, mechanism. Um, so basically, what's the motivation? Um, we want to introduce a kind of a generic mechanism to improve the efficiency of the topology updates for money, mobile ad hoc networks. Um, so it is intention to integrate that mechanism into various um, routing protocols. But in order to make the concept clear, we didn't do that. So in these drafts, if you read the text, basically um, it's right by its own. So in terms of the formatting concepts and um, uh, the flows, whatever. But um, um, eventually, we want to, for instance, if we want to integrate it into OLSR version two, we will use that formatting, right? So, but in this presentation, I will want, want to to clearly state that um, we need to focus on the general concepts, um, the um, the idea, and uh, the mechanism itself. So the core part basically is uh, topology updates um, will be triggered by the change of the ongoing communication relation instead of change of the topology itself. We believe that um, if the topology changes, for instance, a new node gets joined or left, um, <clears throat> as long as it does not impact the existing service or applications, why should we flood the whole network with topology refreshing, right? So, um, so if we detect that um, the current existing service or application does not get impacted, we should be silent until the moment that we find that's needed. Um, another idea, basically, um, the topology might be updated partially rather than globally, which has not been reflected in this um, first version of the draft, but we are going to do that in the next iterations. So um, in, for the stroop, basically, we are looking for something between reactive and proactive routing protocols. Um, proactive routing protocols actually um, is good to provide a much better quality of experience for users. 
Um, but on the other hand, in terms of efficiency, energy efficiency, for instance, is a bit low. But um, reactive is on the other side. So we want to position the stoop mechanism somewhere in the position as shown on the figure, right? Next, please. <clears throat> so um, this is the table of contents and the key message. Basically, we introduce um, the topology hashing and sync radius are two different concepts we introduce into the hello message, which will be exchanged only between neighbors from time to time. And um, as I mentioned before, that topology refreshing will be triggered um, in response to the change of the communication relation. Um, then the important concept I like sync radius will be updated. Um, sync radius basically is a concept um, indicates that um, uh, within how far the topology information is synchronized. Next, please. <clears throat> so this will be uh, a rough hello message. Um, route ID, basically, you can consider this uh, identificator or its address. Um, then we introduce 32-bit topology hash. So instead of the full topology information, we just do a hashing. And um, the, with this hashing information um, carried in the hello message, then you know from the neighbors that whether the topology you have is the same as the topology a neighbor has. If the hash value is different, then you, you know it's different. Another concept we introduce in this hello message is um, sync radius. As I mentioned, um, it's a one byte sync radius if the values n indicates that within n hop, hops, um, all the nodes share the same um, topology information, which means the packet can be routed with n hops without problem. Next, please. <clears throat> So um, the, then the next is a topology synchronization message. So um, the, from the top part, basically, is uh, the first part of the message. Um, version is a version of this protocol. And the type indicates whether it's request or response. Uh, root ID, as um, indicates, is identifier. Could be the address, right? Um, nonce is a random number generated by the request itself. And then the important part is number of records. So the number of records basically is a number of neighbor information table. In our concept, basically, every, or every node in the network will have the overall topology information, which means they will have the overall view of the whole network. And how do we represent then that? We represent by the neighbor information table. So you will know all the neighbor information table of the whole network instead of your own neighbors. Um, so in this topology synchronization message, basically you need to carry all the information. So uh, the first is uh, you need to say how many tables do you have. Each record represents one table, one neighbor information table. So if you have, for instance, 200 nodes in this uh, ad hoc network, you will have 200 records. Each record represents one, right? Um, then on the bottom part um, are per record, you will have this kind of format. Uh, besides the type, length, number of neighbors, um, or those usual number of neighbors basically indicates if you have one node, you have three neighbors, then you say it will be three neighbors, right? Um, then um, for each neighbor, you need to list um, his address, what will be the link, media, list, uh, the cost of this link, for instance, those information. So you can consider the topology synchronization message will carry uh, the overall topology information uh, in order to synchronized between different neighbors. Next, please. So how do we implement the neighbor detection? 
Um, I draw on the screen basically a very simple example uh, with node A and B, right? When the node starts, they will exchange a hello message where in this message, I send to the, um, the other parts, the address, the topology hash value, and uh, the sync radius. At the very beginning, address is your own address while the hash value are set to zero because you know nothing about that or assume A does not, not, not have anything while the single readers is also zero. So once you receive that message, you will update, okay, I A find B as a neighbor, B find A as a neighbor. So you will create actually a neighbor information table for yourself. So A creates a um, neighbor information says, uh, B is my neighbor while B does the same. And then after that, um, the topology information database will be updated. Um, so uh, topology information, uh, the TSM, so the, the topology synchronization message will be immediately exchanged between two neighbors. Um, in that case, um, so you will see from the number four on the screen that um, A will have a topology information database of neighbor, neighbor information table A and B. B will have also the same A and B. So everyone knows everything, basically. And then afterwards, um, with the exchange of the hello message, um, the sync readers will be updated. Um, I have one slide to, to, to introduce the algorithm, how do we calculate the sync readers. Next, please. Then here basically is uh, saying that um, if C joins the previous A and B message, what will happen? Of course, the first exchange will uh, hello message will bring C actually in sync with the whole network. So what happens basically is after exchange the hello message between C, C and B, and um, then uh, B detected there will be C, and immediately the, between B and C only, they will synchronize the topology. So C will get the, what B has, and B will get what C has. Um, so in such, you will see the interesting thing is um, the single radius of B will change from one to zero because there's a new newcomer. Uh, your hash value changes. So he will change from one to zero, while for C, in fact, from zero to one because he finds that C is fully synchronized with B. And um, for that information actually will be kept in such until the full network topology gets synchronized. And then the uh, sync readers um, will be uh, updated. So yeah, maybe first, next slides, I will say. You have two minutes left. Next, next, um, I will change the order. So please, yeah. So how the single radius will be, be calculated? Basically, it's very simple. You check with all your neighbors. If the topology hash value is the same with all the neighbors, then you will, the, uh, the single radius will be the uh, minimum value of all the single radius plus one. And if you find any of your neighbor, even with one, um, indicated that his topology information is not synchronized with you, then you, you have to clear your single radius, which means your value will be zero. So this is actually a way uh, fully understandable in, in, in the sense that if a newcomer joins in, then your um, single readers will be clear to zero because uh, you find the new one does not have the same um, topology hash value with all the old ones. So if you can move back to the previous slides. Yeah. So you will see that um, <clears throat> if you only look at the single radius value, um, you will see that um, when the C joins to the network, um, because C only has B as a neighbor, so he think he is fully synchronized with B, 
and uh, his signal radius is one, while B's signal radius will be zero because uh, he finds that the topology hash value uh, A um, is not the same as topology uh, hash value of B. But after network uh, synchronization, everything will be synced back. Next, please. I need to speed up a, a bit. Yeah, you're out of time. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so what's a, uh, how do we use that single radius value? So the nice thing is if you need to launch a new application from A to D, you first check if the single uh, radius value is okay for you to do that or not. So uh, you, for instance, from A to D, you check basically the uh, number of, of hops and uh, if you find that um, the hash value between A and B is the same, which means from A and B, you can reach your topology information is the same, then you check whether the single radius value from B is larger or equal to N minus two. So N minus two means um, uh, from B side, um, you can reach to the next hop, then um, from, from next hop, you can reach to to the D. So if that condition matches, you don't need to flood the whole network again, you just launch this application. If one of the condition like uh, topology information uh, hash or the single radius does not meet the requirements, you need to do a network refresh, a uh, topology refresh. Rick, do you want to? First off, very interesting work. Um, very interesting indeed. I got a couple of two questions. Yeah. Question number one, if A, B, and C form a triangle, then I'm not sure how your radius value works because B if I'm A and B sends me uh, a topology update, so I increment my, my sync radius now goes up to one. C sends me an update. My sync radius now goes up to two. No. But actually, okay, no. I may have misunderstood that. Yeah, because um, if a B send you a A, a yeah. update, you, you will say that, okay, but C is a newcomer or not? Newcomer, yeah. C is another newcomer, right? So when, um, when B joins, and then instead of becomes a one, you become a zero first. Because uh, so it resets to okay. your yeah you you reset, but after synchronization you will be the same right, okay. and then when the the C joins first reset because uh, I'm okay. I'm I'm one of my neighbor changes right so so that that leads nicely on to my second question which is you have a sequence number in there so I am assuming so you work out which message precedes the other message how are you ensuring that if, if C and D both join at the same time, that, that I don't, because of the nature of the medium between the two, one has yeah. much longer latency Very than the question. other, that I get old information after the new information has arrived and I then clock right. my sinks down. Or uh, Do you have a solution to that? Yes. So in one of the previous slides, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's a third slide. If you um, Which can slides? help. Number three, I think. But I'm not, I'm not sure. We really uh, don't have time for a very sorry, long discussion. Uh, uh, yeah, a quick answer is fine for me. Then the the one after next. So you click twice. Next one. Yeah. So here, basically, there's a number. Sorry, maybe I skipped the introduction. There's a sequence number. Yeah. It's a self-incremental number uh, starting from a random uh, number, of course. Uh, the bigger number indicates a more recent version of the neighbor information table. So if I receive a neighbor information table of 17, I think it's 13. I now move to He 18. will overwrite the 13 one. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Julius? Uh, yes. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that this is meant to augment an existing routing protocol such as OLSR or something else, right? Uh, at least this is the ultimate goal, yeah. So uh, 
so there is the existing routing table that's built by OLSR. And then this routing table gets augmented by the data obtained by, by start, right? Is that the goal? Well, um, how the real uh, formatting of the table will happen, as I indicated at the very beginning of my presentation, that we still need to look at it. Well, what we wrote um, in this text is uh, better um, illustrates this mechanism, generic mechanism or concept. Mm -hmm. Yes, so if you're but what, what I wanted to say is that taking two routing tables, even if both are correct, and combining them in such a way that you actually get something that makes sense is a very difficult problem. Okay, and... Uh, well, so okay, okay, now I, I understand. So you're talking about a routing table, right? So mm -hmm. um, maybe... Well, the um, ultimate goal is to build a routing table. Yes. All the rest are so, just technical details. If you see in this presentation, I didn't mention anything about routing table, but in the, in, in the text, I do remember we put some examples. Well, in this presentation, I show the hello message, uh, the TSM message, but mm -hmm. how do you calculate the table is a way that we can really leverage existing... But that is, not, that is not what worries me. What worries me is once you've calculated the STIRP routing table, how do you combine it with the OLSR routing table so that you get something that makes sense? And I really think that's something that needs to be clarified. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure whether I get your point because um, the calculation way way of the uh, the calculation you still use the existing one. For instance, shortest paths or whatever you can still use existing one, right? Here I only update the neighbor information table and um, the topology information. So how do you calculate the routing table based on this neighbor information and the uh, uh, topology information? is out of the con uh, scope of this uh, draft or this text. I think we have to leave it at that uh, and continue on the list. But I want to give Christopher Dierloff, who is a veteran of this group and uh, has <coughs> made many very good uh, contributions. He's one of the main authors uh, of Olazar version 2. And he has, he's in the UK. and. Uh, Got up in the middle of the night uh, just to be here. So, uh, Christopher, uh, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, yes. Right, yes. I wasn't sure about the IT. Yes, I mean, I think what we have here is a routing protocol, which might be something that the working group wants to take up. But I think in terms of extending OLSR v2, you don't start from here. You start from saying what, what could be done better and I think one of the things the authors of OLSR v2 could have done better is there's a missing internet draft explaining how, or RFC, explaining how there are lots of features already in OLSR v2 to do things like handle networks that are slowly changing and so on. There is a possible scope for a local topology fast exchange based on the OLSR v2 structure. And there is one small glitch that, I would, that I'm aware of in terms of the presentation there. But I don't think taking a protocol like this and then saying, how do we fit this on top of OLSR v2 is the right approach. Um. Yeah, so uh, I think um, at least comments you already clearly indicates in email and we agreed upon that, as I uh, mentioned at the very beginning that um, um, we, we, we wrote in such a way to make people better understand how, how this mechanism works. Well, indeed, if we want to go for the OSR version 2 or Babel or other routing protocols, um, then we need to write um, um, accordingly. Because uh, as you indicate, in OSR version 2, you have the certain formats and you have certain uh, way of add extension message. And then in terms of formatting, we need to follow that. I That's, think it's I more think than... I think it's really great. I think it's more than just formatting. I think it's philosophy. And I think also you're, you're here sort of discussing a more sort of stable network that people are joining, whereas the M in Manet is mobile and OLSR v2 is aimed at the 
is aimed in its primary use, though there are other, other ways of using it, and a sort of highly fluid network where links are being made and broken all over the network. And so it's that is the reason for why it is as it is. Yeah. I'm very sorry, but I think uh, the discussion has to be continued on the list no. to give uh, <laughs> yep. uh, Donald, as a working group uh, participant, yep. the opportunity to present uh, yep. what he wants to present. Yep. And thanks uh, again, Christopher. Yeah, good to be back, <laughs> even if only briefly. So I am Donald Eastlake from Future Way Technologies. Uh, I'm actually a new co-chair. I'm sorry I showed up a little late. But, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, Babel for RWA 80211. So I uh, was formerly the chair of the 80211S uh, mesh task group in a uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, and uh, currently co-chair of Babel, which is going to be shut down very shortly. So this is the contents of this presentation. Uh, next slide. So probably a lot of people know about it, but I just have a couple slides on what Babel is. It's a distance vector uh, <clears throat> mechanism, but it has a mechanism, additional mechanisms for loop avoidance and also to avoid starvation, which sometimes can be caused by loop avoidance. So uh, it basically re converges faster and does lots of good things. Uh, you're going a little bit. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's been a particularly shown to be particularly effective in networks with have a variety of links of different qualities like wireless has, where some are good connections and some are bad, and hybrid wireless and wired. Next slide. So is a, it's all standardized in an RFC. It did well in the European Battle Mesh Contest. If you go to this uh, URL, there's nothing on that page. But if you click on any of the results tabs, it'll show Babel against other ones. Multiple open source implementations. Uh, if you go to this uh, Wikipedia page, it tells you more about it, and probably the uh, most in-depth single document is the PDF reference at the bottom here, which actually references the previous experimental RFC, which was obsoleted by the standards track uh, 8966, but there's really no essential difference on the technical details. Next slide. So what about this 802.11 mesh? Uh, originally, it was targeted at just wireless backhaul, which is a way to get stuff back from APs so you could have a access wireless Wi-Fi access point <clears throat> that went through one or more access points, multi-hop, perhaps back to uh, the distribution system, and normally a wired infrastructure. Next slide. So what this was generalized uh, pretty soon to, to make mesh a uh, general peer-to-peer uh, -peer mesh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, one in which uh, you uh, basically, from the outside world, uh, can view the entire mesh as being a link. Uh, and can have multiple connections. Uh, this shows a, a mesh in the packet going through along the solid line. Uh, so being an access point and being a mesh point are really orthogonal in the current standard. So any one of these could also be an access point and have stations dangling off of it, in which case that would also be a place where you could enter or leave the mesh. Next slide. So what happens is basically the mesh stations all send out beacons periodically with a mesh ID, which is like an SSID, uh, but different, uh, same size. Uh, and an ID for what path selection protocol, otherwise known as routing, they're using, and what path metric they're using. So mesh uh, stations where uh, these match, peer with each other, negotiate a pairwise key. Each mesh station distributes a group key to its peers for multicast and broadcast. And as I say, the entire link appears to be, uh, the entire mesh appears to be a link from the outside. So 11 believes in a single unified but complicated header. <laughs> None of this layering stuff. Uh, it's all all in a layer two, I guess. So there's like lots of option flags and extensions. So inside this mesh on a radio hop, a uh, 802.11 mesh packet can have up to six MAC addresses, which are the radio transmitter and the radio receiver for a unicast packet, uh, where it entered the mesh and where it's going to leave the mesh, the MAC address is there, and the actual original source address and destination address, assuming it's going through the mesh. Next slide. So uh, here's the mesh, which has, and in fact, the place where the mesh connects to the outside world, there's actually a component called a gate. And uh, you might wonder if it's, there's multiple connections to outside networks that are all connected to each other. 
uh, what stops there from being loops? Well, if these networks are IP routers, there's no problem. IP routers can handle that. If the external network is bridged, then actually spanning tree will break the loops. This is all 802, you know, uh, layer two stuff. Next slide. So uh, it uses the past selection protocol and link metric to determine how it forwards. When it was developed, it was realized that different meshes would have different requirements. Uh, different mesh stations might have different uh, capabilities, uh, different numbers of radios, different uh, computational capacity, different storage capacity, and so on. So it was designed so you could have different uh, path selection protocols. Uh, and uh, the only one that ended up in the final standard was called, it's called HWMP, Hybrid Wireless Mesh Protocol, called Hybrid because it's basically uh, based on AODV, but there's a, a tree-based addition. You can configure certain nodes as tree roots, and it'll make trees. So stuff can either flow over the tree or using the reactive AODV. Earlier on in the effort, <coughs> there was something called Radio Aware OLSR, uh, but there's a tremendous pressure uh, to simplify things in the two standards effort sometimes, and it, it got cut. Next slide. So uh, there are implementations and uses of 802 mesh. If you go look up 802 mesh in the Wikipedia, you find uh, information on that sort of thing. Um, you can actually download the 802.11 standard. The 802.11s amendment has been rolled into the standard. Uh, a warning, the 802.11 standard is about 5,000 pages. So it might be helpful going to sleep or something, but in there is the mesh stuff. Um, it's, it, it's uh, available for free for download for personal use. Uh, as all 802 standards are after six months because industry pays IEEE to make them free then. And like uh, this, the, the, the bottom, like a lot, a lot of times the major features added to 802.11, every one seems to come with its own power save and light sleep and deep sleep and its own congestion management. There's a mesh beacon collision avoidance feature and a way to reserve airtime and so on and so forth. Um, but the... the uh, the, the mesh, uh, the path selection protocol identifier, you can do a, a vendor specific one. So we could allocate our own uh, path selection protocol identifier under the IANA OUI. Next slide. Uh, so what would you really do if you were doing this project? Uh, primarily you would write an IFT, IETF RFC specifying how do you use Babel as the routing method inside 802.11 mesh. Uh, you could also specify how to use uh, one or more uh, Babel link metric. There's, for example, this draft, which is fairly far along. I'm going to pop out pretty soon on a round trip time extension to Babel, which uses uh, a derivative of round trip time with appropriate history system limiting as the link metric. And uh, tertiarily, I said, I'm not sure if tertiarily is really a word, but sort of 802.11 for Babel. 802.11 uses a airtime link metric which the first approximation is how long it takes to broadcast an eight kilobyte packet, uh, for actually a frame, 802 is a frame, not a packet. Uh, and so it's the airtime used by that, which depends of course on the current link characteristics of the radio link. Uh, and you could use that in, in Babel. Uh, next slide. Um, it would be simpler to do a path selection protocol based on Babel than the existing Babel protocol in a few ways. It wouldn't need to have IP prefixes and longest match and stuff, just deal with MAC addresses. Uh, there wouldn't need the router ID and address differentiation. You can use MAC addresses for everything. You wouldn't need the Babel security features, which are in two other RFCs, one which provides authentication, the other provides encryption as well, because 802.11 has its own security. Similarly, you wouldn't like 802.11 has its own multicast stuff, with, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, it would be somewhat of a simpler protocol. And uh, Babel is very flexible with, on link metric. And so it should work well if you just use it with the existing 802.11 airtime metric, which is uh, already implemented and supported. Next slide. We do have explicit permission from 802.11 to do this. <clears throat> there was a presentation made to the May meeting this year, and you can go look at the slides. Uh, everything in 802 is publicly available except the draft standards and the standards themselves, unless they specifically decide to make those available uh, as they do for standards after six months. And anyway, that presentation caused the liaison back to IETF, which said that 
although A211 is not going to stick its neck out and say whether this is a good idea or not. They're happy to say that they have no objection. Um, and it's, we can do it easily because it was designed for other people to be able to develop, develop uh, path selection protocols. And we shouldn't need to get any code points uh, that we can't generate ourselves. But actually, the rest of the liaison says if we do turn out to need some code points or will be helpful, they'd be happy to consider requests from us for other code points in their protocol. Next slide. So uh, this should uh, be, I think it might be encompassed by the Babel maintenance item, but it could also be added as a separate thing. And uh, so support in the draft uh, in Manet would be a good thing. And uh, basically somebody needs to write a draft to sort of start things going to that. You're not in the queue, Lou. Lou Berger having trouble getting in the queue. <laughs> um, uh, definitely interesting. The question that comes to mind is uh, why here? Why at the why should the IETF be doing a two eleven protocol control plane pro protocol? Well, the uh, IETF owns the Babel protocol. Uh, we have change control over it, and it would be in the Babel working group, except that working group is being shut down, and the Babel maintenance is moving here. So this is basically, I don't know. Uh, I mean, we, we why not? <laughs> I mean, if you're assuming it's a good thing to be done, I think the, the expertise uh, the, I, for Babel is sure, here. Sure, the expertise for the control protocol is here, but the expertise for the wireless protocol is there. Well, I don't know. I'm here. <laughs> um, I think we've gotten into trouble when we take on other SDOs data plane and try to do things. And it's, it has caused friction in the past. Um, that's why I, I, I just, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not, it doesn't resonate with me, but okay. that's okay. I'm just one well, person. I, I, I will not force you to work on it. <laughs> I'll roll. I'll go to a future way. I want to ask the other question. I, I just looked at the slides that you presented in 802. Yes. And uh, several of the slides say, why should 802 be interested in this? Uh, but I guess the result was that they were not. Well, I didn't. Why? I mean, why are they not interested in this? And, and you know, the further question, of course, goes into, if we do this, um, are people going to implement it and use it? Or is IEEE going to say, well, we don't know anything about this? Or, or what's going to happen with this? I would think that we would want somebody to be implementing it, even if in like sort of an experimental test mode, uh, as part of the development of the specification, uh, determine that it works. There is support for 802.11 mesh in the in Linux and BSD and stuff. So there's places that is this code in there. Uh, it has been used before for like the one laptop per child and various other projects. So uh, I think there's places uh, where we could uh, get existing hard software frameworks and uh, hardware that, for which it could be implemented. Um, I, I can't, you know, I, don't, I can't say there's a guarantee of implementation, but if we start this effort, there's no guarantee it would complete successfully, like any effort, but I don't know. Doing this in 802.11 would be, a, a, you know, require a lot more bureaucratic overhead. I mean, you would have to get a, a new task group created uh, to do an amendment to the 802.11 standard, which would have to be approved by the 802.11 working group, the Landman Standards Committee, mm -hmm. and the IEEE Standards Board. And, you know, dot, 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 I don't know. This is going to take up uh, the remainder of the hour, but uh, uh, there's no time to do this uh, recharging discussion anyway, so I let it go for the moment. So I, I'll try and be quick. Um, Rick Taylor. So I don't think there's any doubt that Babel works. I don't think there's any doubt that the 802.11s has the relevant hooks to put it in. I don't think there's any doubt that someone could do the work to replace the router IDs with MAC addresses. I don't know where the use case is. I don't, I, I would expect a 
a radio manufacturer to say, I want to do this, I want to make my product better. And then that's the driving force of making it work. I, I feel like this would be, I mean, okay, someone in academia might, might say this is a great little way to get a PhD, but it maybe isn't valid for a PhD. This is, this is a, a thought exercise because I don't see any pressing industrial need for it. It, I don't, um, well, I, I, I'm not. My belief would be that that uh, 8 to 11 mesh under a substantial number of different circumstances would work better with Babel than with the current. I'm not disagreeing. No, I, so, I, I agree with you as well. But okay. I think this feels a little bit like build it and they will come. But I'm not convinced well, of an argument there. I, I'm not saying this is a bad idea. Hmm. Just it feels a little bit of a thought exercise. Well, okay. Let's just comment. So that leaves us with four minutes for a, a recharging discussion. Um, so that will have to go to the list, definitely. Yeah. But. Uh, you could uh, have a look at the uh, last three uh, slides of the chair slides where I listed the current wor work items, uh, which ones are done, which ones never went anywhere. And then there are suggestions for, for uh, new items. But well, I will also uh, uh, take this to the list and uh, um, we have to take it from there because we, yeah, one hour is uh, not very long for a session. Uh, Jim? Yeah, there was one thing that came up actually um, in the RTG working group this morning um, that at least from my initial look at it seems like it could fall under work that A, could fit into Man A, but also might be very interesting work. And it was around um, some of the satellite routing um, requirements. So, uh, just for if, if you weren't in the in 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 that working group, I just wanted to let you know that um, my suggestion to the RTG WG chairs was that they come and have a nice little conversation with the Mane chairs to discuss that. Um, so that could be something that we take on here. I will leave that up to the chairs to have that conversation and then also have the conversation with the working group and to see if that's something that might fit here. But I just wanted to warn you that uh, you should get approached by the RTG WG chairs on this. That's excellent. Uh, thank you. We briefly mentioned this uh, in the session at uh, ITF 113 in Vienna. and. Uh, yeah, I thought they had gone away and found a different home, but uh, yeah, they're very welcome to come back. Um, I'm going to throw a feature away. Um, I was actually going to say something else, but uh, these are different satellite people. Ah. Um, so it's, uh, <laughs> but what we're seeing is, is a bunch of you know, satellite interests. Um, you know, part of the thing is that, of course, Mane doesn't own all the protocols. And maybe the protocols that would be used in a satellite are not the Mane protocols, but you know, these are things that are moving and that are forming ad hoc networks. And maybe there's some experience here to do some of the frameworking, or at least to say, right. hey, this, that doesn't work, or whatever. Uh, now, what I really wanted to say is that um, we've been trying to recharter for the last, uh, I, I don't know how long. Um, we should, I want to propose that we set up an interim meeting. This should go to the list. We set up an interim meeting for, I don't know, six weeks from now. Tuesday, whatever the date is, at uh, 2 p.m. UTC, and that's it. We close it there, and then we get it done, because otherwise we're going to be here you know, for the rest of our lives, and uh, we're never going to finish. Uh, and at the same time, we should uh, push all of uh, Lou's documents out before that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to need Lou's help for that. Thanks, Alvaro. <laughs> I, I was going to repeat that after he made that comment at one meeting, I followed up with the comment of, Let's not recharter until we get these documents published and then recharter. I thought you were in favor of doing things in parallel. <laughs> we're out of time. Thank you all for uh, 
for attending, especially uh, the people that uh, needed to go uh, to get up uh, in the middle of the night or, or stay up late uh, to, to be here. Uh, much appreciated. I like the coordination of shirts, by the way. Yeah, it was entirely, uh, you know, entirely, uh, <laughs> entirely ad hoc, yes. Although you didn't tell Don about it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it was just not fluffy. We didn't, never spoke about it or anything. I would like to say uh, great minds think alike, but it would not apply to me. So, <laughs> adjourned. that you were appointed as a, an additional chair and I said that you were going to be fired if you didn't show up until that. <laughs> and now I have to go to the toilet pretty badly. I'll be back.